Northwest Liberty News. Picking the lock on the shackles of tyranny. Machines are going to fail. And the system's going to fail. The past is past, the future's now. Don't look at me. I think these people are completely nuts. Sometimes trouble just follows a man. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. Can't you stop your lips from flapping for two little minutes? Because I'm white. I'm a man. I'm sensitive. I need to feel loved. I need to be desired. Man, I'm rapping this is coming the big underground success in this. Yeah. Oh, that's a question of methods. Everybody wants results, but nobody wants to do what they have to do to get them back. And now, coming to you live from Kalispell, Montana, brought to you by Northwest Liberty News, it's Montana Gazette Radio, with your host, James White. Okay, so I'm your host, James White. This is Montana Gazette Radio. Thanks so much for joining me here today on the 16th day of August. 2021. I am delighted to be coming to you live here with a, a great show today. Uh, really eagerly anticipating this uh, this roundtable. Going to have a lot of great folks here. A lot of great folks are already online. A couple more going to be coming on here soon. A couple of notes here real quick. Uh, I'm expecting the, the computer system we've been talking about for three weeks to help run the AM and FM uh, network here is uh, supposed to arrive today via FedEx. So I could have to break out briefly and and, and sign that uh, sign that that uh, that bill here for the for the computer but the good news is that means that the uh the launch on am and fm radio here will be will be will be coming very soon and all this will go away this all this uh, images that you see here and everything's all going to be different much more professional and uh, we were looking forward to that and we're expanding out uh, hopefully into great falls and the helena area we're in negotiations right now with uh with uh, those folks and also missoula so uh we're just hoping to uh, to get the truth all around the state and uh, continue to uh, punch the bad guy right in the mouth every day and let him know that we're not putting up with the tyranny any longer. That's for sure. Okay, let's have a great show today. We have a roundtable, the uh, Cyber Symposium Roundtable. Now, let me, uh, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about here, let me pop this up real quick. The uh, folks on my show today went to this uh, Cyber Symposium last week. Mike Lindell, the pillow guy, is probably more uh, better recognized as the pillow guy. Uh, they went to the symposium last, last week in, I believe it was South Dakota. And uh, we wanted to have him here on the show today to uh, sort of uh, uh, debrief all of us here on uh, what happened. And uh, there's a couple of things, I think, interesting things that came out of that. A couple of things that I've observed and I want to talk about as well. But uh, again, folks, we're going to have uh, the great guests around with us here now. And they're going to be guests are going to be coming in and out uh, as, uh, as the show progresses. So let's, uh, let's welcome them here to the broadcast and take them all off of mute. And we will welcome them to the show. I should be clicking the button here. It should be asking you, uh, you fellas, to unmute right now. And I'll tell you what we'll do if we can. Everybody's uh, unmuted. Paul, there you go. Okay. Um, all right. What we're going to do is uh, welcome, gentlemen. Appreciate you being here. We're still waiting for, uh, for um, Brad Cheetah and Teresa Manzella. But if we could, before we get going, if we could just, if you just let's go around, start with you, Bob, and we'll just go sort of around in a clockwise manner and just introduce yourself real quick so people can put the name with the face because all the names, of course, are underneath here, as you can see because I can't put them right into the Zoom call. But uh, if you could start with you, Bob, and just go around uh, at the corner. Jerry, to you next, and then Darren. Okay, my name is Bob Phelan. I represent House District 36, and I live in eastern Montana. Jerry? All right, thanks, Bob. Um, my name is Jerry Schillinger. I represent House District 37. Actually, I live just about 20 miles from Bob as the crow flies. I represent uh, Garfield, Macomb Prairie, Fallon, Carter, part of Powder River and part of Custer County. So I have a big district, uh, a lot of great folks. Hey, yeah, my name is uh, Darren Gobb. I'm the executive director of Restore Liberty. And I live downtown Helena, Montana, and I'm not a representative, uh, but I went there for a different purpose and it was a very good experience. Steve? I am Representative Stephen Galloway. I have the blessed uh, opportunity to serve the constituents of House District 24. That's the southeast side of Great Falls. And uh, this is my first session, and it's uh, great to serve the people of Montana. 
Paul. I'm Paul Fielder. I live in Thompson Falls, Montana. I'm in House District 13, which includes very western Montana, right up against the Idaho line in Sanders County, and also the northwest portion of Flathead County. Thanks, Paul. And of course, we're joined just now by Teresa. Teresa, over to you. Uh, I guess we're doing introductions. I came in a little late. Sorry, you're correct. Uh, My I, bad. Yes. <laughs> I am Senator Therese Manzella representing the Bitterroot Valley, the north end of the Bitterroot Valley. I've had the honor of representing the south end of the Bitterroot Valley as a House representative in the uh, prior three terms. And and my fourth term is at that of a senator and uh, Senate District 44. Happy to be here. Great. Happy to have you. Thanks so much. And Brad Cheetah should be here at- Oh, I don't know, 20, 15 minutes or so. I know he's on another call. Then we'll, we'll, we'll uh, welcome him into the broadcast when he arrives. Okay, I'd like let to start me, off. Uh, Go ahead. Let me share with you, uh, Jim. We were on the phone with the Secretary of State, and that call's just ended. And we lost Brad just a few minutes uh, prior to the end of our call. So I'm not sure if he's traveling through a, an area with poor cell reception or something. But he, he should be here. Very good. Thanks so much okay. for that. Okay, so what I'd like to do, if we can, is just start, and what we'll do is we'll just go around. I don't know if you guys can see the same image I am, but we'll start with sort of with Bob, and we'll go in a clockwise manner around. If we can, just get, if we can, just, just, to, just to start off, uh, you, you all have just come back from that cyber symposium, the, the image I showed here before we, we really got kind of get into the show. If you can just give us an overall grade, just to start off before we get into the questions, give us sort, sort of the, the macro, and then we'll get down to the micro. Give an overall grade, like a, you know, like a, a letter grade between A and E. Uh, what your what your thoughts were overall about the about the conference and the the the, uh, the, uh, the information you learned while you were there, Bob? We'll start with you. Well, thank you, Jim, for having us on this uh, program. But anyway, I would grade uh, that symposium an A for sure. I mean, because the the amount the amount of people that watched it was I what I heard was forty million, and so anyway, I think it was a I give it an A grade. So, Jerry, thank you. Ron. Well, I'm giving an A as well, and, and I guess uh, one of the big takeaways that I had from it, uh, besides the far-reaching uh, that it had around the world, was just how vast the opportunities are to corrupt our elections, um, and and how many really relatively easy things we can do to start cleaning them up. So I think it's uh, really was stressed there and, and we need to stress as well. This isn't a Republican or Democrat thing. It's a, it's an American thing and we just need to have safe and secure elections so people can feel confident about going to the polls. You know, Darren, hats off to you. You got on actually on Steve Bannon's show there on the war room, which is a, that has lots and lots of viewers. So uh, give us your overall uh, view, uh, Darren, of the, uh, of the conference. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Now, I I also would give it an A. There was uh, there were a lot of things that were intended out of that symposium, and I got to see all of them realized. And it's not like you know the entire thing was a house of cards that was going to fall the day after the symposium, and everything was going to be fine and fixed. It's it was really what I saw described as the beginning of the end piece. A lot that was very accurate to see fifty legislators from fifty states get together and build a caucus and plan on moving forward and sharing strategies. That's a huge deal. Plus all the networking that I saw on the side halls and the side rooms and everything going on that wasn't even on the main stage. Uh, it accomplished everything that I knew it was intended to accomplish before I even went there. Steven, same, uh, same question over to you. Yeah, I'd, I'd go A plus even um, as apprehensive as I approached it. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I figured I'd go a day see what it was about and possibly, you know, continue on if it seemed like it was worthwhile of, of time and being away from everything else that a person has responsibility for. And it, it was impressive. I mean, we had three 12 hour days approximately, you know, the last day was a little shorter, but, uh, you know, each, each day, each hour built upon the previous time and it, the amount of information we were able to ingest and, and uh, how much I think that we all lack and take for granted in the ballot process. Um, you know, going from paper ballots to this electronic gauge, um, we're not taking the steps that we need to to ensure that a person's vote is really a person's vote. 
and uh, between the scientific, the mathematic, the cyber experience, experience folks that were there and be able to educate us uh, folks that have no uh, no comprehension in these issues. It was, it was very impressive. I, I came away um, very concerned, but very fired up that uh, there's a great work that we need to do and that we can do if we put our heads together. But, you know, I think the big thing is, is the people that have watched that out there, um, people need to learn that it, it, it's about them educating themselves too. I mean, we can do so much as the servants that they've elected us to do, but it really does take a groundswell from the people mm-hmm. if we're going to get anything accomplished. Paul Fielder, HT13, what was your thoughts on the conference overall? I'd grade it differently. I'd grade it with a B plus. Uh, there was a lot of information there, but as I talked to some of the presenters, I told them, you guys are preaching to the choir. That's why we're here. We believe there was problems with the election. And what I want is tools to bring back. I want talking points to bring back and I want data. I was, uh, I was, a, I was a research biologist for my career and I, I look at the hard information. Uh, one of the biggest values that I came, so that's why I gave it a B, a B plus. Uh, one of the big values that I saw there was the people that we were able to make contact with. So this didn't end when the symposium ended. Uh, we've got good contact information that we can follow up with people and keep this thing moving. There were uh, representatives from all 50 states there, and there were a lot of legislators from all around the country there. And we broke out separately, uh, just the legislators, to talk about how we can have a, a unified plan moving forward. So that was a big plus there. Um, again, we talked to the, the presenters and we got contact information with them so we can follow up on some of the details that I'm looking for. Um, and as we were driving back, you know, Sioux Falls, South Dakota is about 1,200 miles from Thompson Falls. So that's a long drive there and back. And yeah. when I was driving back, I was getting phone calls on my, you know, you know my truck phone and, uh, and emails when I would stop somewhere people from all over the country thanking us for being there, uh, whether they were in my district or not. Most of them weren't in my district. So there were a lot of people watching. They were paying attention and they were thankful for the people that showed up and represented them. And we still got a lot of work to do uh, with with the, the bit of information that we got at this symposium. And uh, we got to have a unified front, not just in Montana, but all across the country. We had six representatives from the Montana legislature there, plus three other people that went there uh, that are very knowledgeable about the situation. Uh, I don't think any other state had six or more representatives there, so we were well represented. Um, We still got a lot of work to do, though. Teresa, thanks, Paul. Teresa, you uh, you actually spoke there. I think I saw. I don't think I actually. I didn't have a chance to see your actual uh, your speech your speech but your presentation. But I know that you did. I think it was about a half an hour. You spoke there. Uh, t- tell us if you can. Was it not so much? It was not not a half an hour. Uh, tell us uh, what, uh, how that was to speak there at that presentation and, and give us an overall grade of what you thought of your time there. You bet. It was five minutes, and uh, we were given that opportunity late in the day. So um, I didn't have a lot of time to prepare. It was, it was an incredible honor to uh, have the opportunity to speak uh, at the cyber symposium. And um, what my focus was in my speech was the legislators responsibility, the state legislators responsibility. This is absolutely the state legislators responsibility to sort this out. And that is a directive from our, both our federal and our state constitution. And if I may, I'd like to read for your audience, Article 4, Section 3 of the state constitution uh, under the heading of elections. The legislature shall provide by law the requirements for residence, registration, absentee voting, and administration of elections. That is our constitutional legislative directive. So it's up to us to sort this out. Now it's gotten kind of convoluted uh, because of the directives, the state directives given to the secretary of state. And uh, there's also a, um, the department of administration plays a rule under the executive branch. They oversee the uh, cybersecurity for our state. So there's a lot to sort out 
Um, but ultimately, if we believe that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and if we take those words literally, we recognize that we, as the state legislature, are, are ultimately responsible for sorting this out and uh, establishing a safe means uh, for, the, for the electors to have a, a voting process. And uh, that's on us. So um, we, I think we all came away with clarity on that issue and we, and we plan to move forward there. That is, that is our goal. Um, and as far as rating the event, I have a tendency to align with, uh, with both my fellow legislators who uh, assigned it an A. Um, the quality of the present, presenters was phenomenal. They had absolutely brilliant people, well-skilled in their areas of expertise that were presenting their data. We had, uh, you know, Dr. Doug Frank, who broke the algorithm utilizing the, the 2010 census. And we had former Senator Pat Kolbeck, uh, who is also an aerospace engineer, and, and he created a, a phenomenal schematic that illustrated uh, the chain of custody and how easy it would be to break that chain and expose the vulnerabilities in the in the chain of custody and we had captain seth keschel who used uh trends and probabilities to show the impossibility of biden winning and um we had colonel phil waldron uh who uh, made a phenomenal case on the 200 ngos that are actually funded by george soros and um the possibilities for um, problems created by that. Um, and then uh, to uh, Senator, or excuse me, Representative Fielder's uh, B, B plus rating. Um, yeah, the, the takeaway, the, the tools that we came home with were maybe just, it could have been beefed up a little bit more, but, but that's where it gets into each state. Um, needing to do their own homework and their own evaluation. And again, that, that is absolutely um, up to the legislators to do that. Additionally, we had the Arizona, the folks from Arizona, the legislators from Arizona that have done an audit and they're, they're far and away the front runners in this uh, and by all accounts have done a phenomenal job with their audit and protecting their audit. So, um, very, very soon, they're going to have a model for the rest of us to follow. So um, we've got a lot of work to do, um, but we've got a lot of great people on the job. Well, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you all to speculate just for a moment here on some things. Now, uh, you know, as you go back and look at previous elections, and I know you're really much probably more focused on the, the, the last election, but you know, there's some unusual things have happened throughout election history, let's say, and people have won when you never really thought they were going to, or you know, your votes been seemingly flipped in the past. From your from your perspective and from what you learned at the conference, uh, I have a feeling this has been going on for many many years. Did you did you get any evidence uh, to that effect that to to get an idea that this has been sort of a systemic problem for quite some time? I mean, I guess my question really is, how how long have they been stealing elections? Uh, do we, have, do we have any better grasp of how long they've been stealing? Because I think it's been for maybe twenty years or more. Uh, uh, you care to go around, Bob, and give your thoughts on that? And go around the circle. Thank you. Yeah, my thought is that they probably have. And I think that when it started is when they put these electronic voting machines in. Now, did they start right away? I have no idea. But I think that was their end goal when they put these, uh, they knew that these, uh, that these uh, machines were hooked up to the internet, even though they say they're not. Because if they say, well, there's no cable, well, they're, <clears throat> They're also capable of Wi-Fi. Most, probably all of them are on Wi-Fi. And so anyway, that's, I believe that they, that was their intention when they put in electronic voting machines. So anyway, that's my thought. Jerry, your thoughts on that? You think this is just a one time, one off, or you think this has been going on for some time? Well, I think it's been going on for quite some time, but the, uh, the electronic part of it has certainly vastly expanded the potential scope and and how it can be tinkered with. I think um, probably for many years in some areas, at least that uh, the election 
has been able to be tampered with just because of inaccurate census numbers. And we have to have accurate census numbers uh, so we can have accurate registered voter rolls. This election was based off the 2010 census. And so you have to, if you're going to have accurate numbers, you have to go in and call that over the years to make sure that it's, it's accurate. Um, this takes a regular cleansing of the rolls. Arizona, as part of their forensic audit, have conducted door-to-door -door canvassing. And what they found is thousands of registered voters that don't exist. They went to voter addresses that turned out to be vacant lots, empty buildings, um, and dead voters. So th what the term they gave us down there in uh, Sioux Falls was these are phantom voters. They don't exist. And some of these even disappear off the rolls after the election. So uh, there's an active, active um, move going on by some of these organizations to uh, to corrupt the the uh, election. So I think one of the very basic things that we need to start with is just making sure we have good, clean voter rolls. You know, Darren, to uh, to inter interfere with the election is a crime, and if people are colluding together to do that, that's a conspiracy to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Do you see, uh, you know, I know that's a word that people don't like to use, but if, if groups of people get together with the intention of committing a crime and then carry it out, that's a conspiracy. I mean, it doesn't matter what channel you're watching. Uh, do you think there's been a conspiracy for some time, Darren, to, to, to steal elections and, and steal votes for maybe not even just this last election, but maybe years uh, b before that? Yeah, Jim, sure. I think that's certainly a possibility. It, it seemed, you said you use the word feeling, and that is, that's really where we're at is, you because proof is lacking for sure. We're looking back in history, but I really truly believe that Bush v. Gore was probably the last election where they started realizing that electronically we could start at hijacking these elections in some scale. You, clearly, there would be a lot of work to spend time going back that far in history to prove anything like that. But it seems pretty clear that this has been going for a while. I like to use the word, the, the phrase that sometimes conspiracy conspiracy theory turns into conspiracy fact, and uh, we have to focus on this one and this one alone, and the rest of it. I think it's safe to assume that uh, th there have been people trying to steal elections for for many many years, but when it comes to the electronic hijacking of this thing, uh, again, Bush v. Gore was probably the last one where uh, we did we did paper and we did paper generally right. Paul, on the evidence that you saw at the conference, did you uh, did you get the feeling, or the, the, at least your, the evidence that you saw that there has been this has been going on for quite some time? Is that your thoughts? Yes, I I feel like at least the last election that we had, not this one, but the one in two thousand sixteen, I think that was uh, probably a rigged election. But they the people that were rigging the election underestimated just how popular the the vote for President Trump was going to be. And uh, they didn't uh, make that big a correction that they needed. And that's why everybody was so surprised in the media and uh, the Democrat Party that, that Hillary Clinton lost. Um, actually, she didn't lose. Trump won because he had such an out, outpouring of support. As Jerry said, you know, the problem goes back to when we started using electronic voting machines because those can be manipulated. Uh, they can be manipulated easily to uh, just throw in additional votes. Jerry mentioned the phantom uh, voters. Everywhere I talked to election officials this year, uh, they talked about the huge number of registered voters we had, and much more than ever before. And those uh, phantom voters are listed in that registered voters uh, higher number so that they can be pulled on to uh, plug into the algorithms, which uh, move one candidate up above the other. Uh, and, you know, we can, I think a lot of this symposium was focused on the presidential election. Um, but I also looked at, I want, I was concerned about the down ticket uh, positions on those ballots. You know, if people vote for the, the, the president for one party, from one party or another, they're probably going to vote for that same party on the down ticket positions. And while Montana had a big Republican sweep in this election, and, uh, you know, we swept all statewide offices. We got majorities in the House and the Senate and, and Donald Trump carried uh, Montana. Um, it could have affected this election rigging, could have affected some down ticket uh, positions. 
and ballot initiatives too. So uh, we've, I, I, I didn't want to just focus on the president election. I was looking at it from the perspective of what other positions were affected. And uh, the people talk about conspiracy theorists and I actually believe the conspiracy theorists are the ones that believe this election was fair. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, Stephen Galloway, we'll, we'll jump over you, uh, Teresa, because I think we kind of switched order a little bit. But Stephen, uh, you're, do you think this is just all just computer mistakes and it just happened uh, in the no normal course of business? Or is there is there some attempt, do you think, to steal votes that's been going back for a year? Stephen, your thoughts? Well, I, I think the big takeaway that I learned is that the, and even just having kind of an argument with an elections educated folk last night here at another convention I'm at, um, you know, he's firmly believes, you know, when they do an audit and they run those ballots through again, you know, they've double checked it as they went in, as they came out, what they're missing. The point is, is that these things have software and these software programs, whether it's one brand or another, they're all similar and they all have back doors or they have accessibility because they're tied to a network. And you can have election administrators that they're right on top of it. They firmly believe in what they're doing, but they have no clue what has happened between when they ran the ballots and then when they audited the ballots. Because in between there, a lot of things can happen inside there electronically that nobody knows about unless we do what's called a forensic audit. And of course, he didn't know what I was talking about. And I honestly think you'll find most election administrators have no idea what we're talking about. But it is truly the only way to know for sure nothing funny happened inside that machine. And we all know how easily we can be hacked. And, and we've seen examples of hacking into a mock election system in less than five minutes from a cell phone by two different individuals. And they were able to completely manipulate the information and do whatever they want. And, and, and without us having access to these machines and to that information, you can't prove anything. Teresa, uh, finish that, finish that line of questioning up if you could, um, in your evidence there, did you, did you see this has been, this has been happening for some, I, th I think it's been going back for maybe two decades. Um, perhaps the Bush Gore, I think is uh, that example is used. Any thoughts on that, Teresa? I think my colleagues explained it very, very well. Um, and as you may be aware, uh, Jim, I've only been involved with politics since 2013. And of course, this situation with the last election has obviously brought it um, into focus for so many of us. Um, but yeah, the, the opportunity for um, tampering uh, is just, it's just so obvious. Uh, and a lot of it, so much of it has to do with the machines. Uh, but there can also be the human element as well. Um, but every aspect from having a qualified voter file to having a, a accurate poll book to handling our ballots properly, and then finally the uh, tabulating the votes, uh, all of those areas have uh, vulnerabilities that absolutely need to be um, addressed and they are uh, magnified by the machines. So um, as you may be aware, the, I believe it was, was it 10 counties in Montana that utilized paper ballots and their, their counties came through clean without any evidence of any types of uh, voter discrepancies. So the data transfers, um, any time a machine is, is connected, has power, and has the opportunity for a wireless or a hardwire connection, uh, there's opportunity for uh, nefarious purposes. Yeah. You know, the, the next, and it's interesting you mentioned that. That was my next question. Uh, I've read, and uh, as I'm sort of reading some of the, the stuff that, that went on during the symposium, I'm understanding that as long as it's connected and, when, and, and the software is routinely updated, they can not only update software, but they can erase things in there as well from what i'm understanding so it's like a two-way you know like a two-way highway there i mean do we do we, i mean i'm gonna sound dramatic but do we need to to like stop that like the emergency cut that off for now and and and, and start having some sort of a a conference or a legislative session or emergency session to get paper ballots back because if they erase all the evidence of their crimes i mean 
what, what, how are we ever going to, how are we ever going to determine what they've done? Um, Bob? <laughs> yes. Uh, they are, they are, to, uh, by law, by federal law, they are to keep all the, all the, uh, the voting records for 22 months. So like Brad said last night, September 3rd, I believe, uh, of 20, of next year, they are, to, they are supposed to have and have those, uh, keep those records. Well, anyway, also, <clears throat> like you said, if they, uh, update, uh, the machine, it automatically erases everything. So you don't have it. That's what we were told anyway. And, uh, and another thing that we were told, if they remove the battery, that it, that uh, all that stuff is uh, gone. All all the records are gone. So I'll let Jerry elaborate. He's a little more. In twenty 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 one, we can't we can't we can't we can't secure records in twenty twenty one. Really, I mean, Jerry. Well, I think Bob pretty well summed it up. But um, what I would say is the local are responsible to maintain those records. And I think what might be happening from what we were told down at the symposium is these um, voting machine companies are coming around the country and their, their regular maintenance to the machines. And I think what a lot of the local officials don't realize is that when they come and do that regular maintenance, that um, the data is disappearing. And I would guess in the fine print of their maintenance contract, that responsibility falls back on the local official and not on the voting machine companies. But I think uh, our local people need to be very aware of that. Darren, do you, did you, do you perceive it being in a, a sort of a dire situation that we're in right now where we should, we should maybe uh, con- disconnect these things from the Internet? I mean, is it, is it, that, is it that serious? Did you get that out from the conference? I do. I think uh... – Actually, Mike Lindell said it quite well when he said we need to melt all these machine bar these machines down and make them into prison bars. They just need to be gone. We need to go back to paper ballots. Uh, as a as a central committee chairman for Lewis and Clark County for the Republican Party, also I need to re-engage with our folks here and talk about poll watchers and election judges. And the these county administrators with the elections offices need to be extremely clear on all of the training that it requires to take to get all of these folks trained to be in those positions and, and be out there in public. It is very difficult to pull information out of the Lewis and Clark County Elections Office on the training for those specific roles and many other things as well. I think Brad has joined us uh, on the line, maybe uh, an audio only. Brad, uh, are you there? I am here this morning, James. Brad, good to have you on. The, good, good to have you on. I know that you're traveling and your, your service is sporadic. Uh, but we want to uh, welcome you to the show, nonetheless. And uh, we've heard from all of uh, all of the, your, your other uh, your other co uh, your uh, your co I guess attendees. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, give you a chance here, Brad, to to get us give us your overall impression of what you thought. Uh, the first question was what you thought of the uh, the overall conference sy- symposium on a on a grade on a grade scale. Uh, can you let us know what you thought of that, uh, Brad, uh, and your time there last week at the symposium? Well, I, I think you could almost, and I don't say this in jest, you could kind of liken it to the first course that you ever took in college where you came out of a high school setting and you, you knew you had a certain amount of preparation, but you weren't exactly sure how the um, how, how things were going to flow, how things were going to go. I have no pre- preconceived notion because I'm uh, not a cyber person by any means, so I was not certain what exactly we could um, anticipate or look forward to. So I went in just to to hear what they had to say because I kind of figured it was going to be technical information about what transpired during the election, what might have happened with machines and security or lack thereof. And um, I I felt like the, the early part of it was, you know, an angry Mike Lindell telling people, why he was angry about things and why he was upset with the news media. But when they started to get more into the nuts and bolts of what was going on, they began to, uh, you know, more clearly define some of the things that were being done by these companies that uh, operate or own control the rights to the software 
that uh, these machines use, and they disclose the fact that there were modems that were connected to the Internet, uh, maybe not full-time, but they were nonetheless connected to the Internet. They were talking to one another. They were uh, information could potentially be sent and received. It could be uh, manipulated. So there, were, there was a lot of good factual information that was brought forward. Was it conclusive, irrefutable proof? I'm not an attorney. I'm not a judge. I think I've been a juror once, but you know, I would say based on the testimony of people like uh, uh, Professor David Clemens, who talked about the amount of information, the amount of um, factual data and proof, he said it was a, it was a stronger case than he's ever had as a prosecutor. So it seems to me that the information that was brought forth, especially the identification of the code that they were able to get from an open source that showed how they had allowed access or de-hardened the software to allow outside sources to get in was pretty damning. So what it, what it allowed me to conclude is that we have, uh, in, in my mind, with, that, with less and less doubt, we have issues with the integrity of our elections because we have people, uh, and I'm not saying it's everybody out there, because there are good people who work in the Missoula County Elections Office and every elections office across the state. Secretary of State is a great lady. I was on the phone with her this morning trying to talk through some things. We are doing some, um, the, the things that are being done by people in the state of Montana and, uh, and other states are clear indications of people who want to manipulate elections. But that is a few people who are using uh, what, whatever control they have over the people who are serving in the uh, immediate and direct elections process to implement their, uh, their work and do things in most cases unbeknownst to them. So I am more and more convinced that there are improper, irregular, call them fraudulent uh, activities going on in elections. And we saw that with data that came from Seth Keschel, data that came from Dr. Doug Franks, uh, the uh, information that was in a video we saw that uh, was narrated by Colonel Phil Waldron. And these are all people who have, you know, uh, statistical and analytical experiences to be able to provide information about um, patterns and, you know, what should be regularities. And the information that was provided to us by, um, Seth Keschel concerning what happened in Mesa County, Colorado, uh, and the amount of growth of Republican votes and the fact that uh, President Trump gained 7,500 votes over the, the previous number he had in 2016. His 2020 numbers were about 7,000 greater, but in a 60% Republican county, Joe Biden somehow managed to get 10,000 more votes, which was 5,500 more than Barack Obama got between 2004 and 2008 as an increase in that county. So there are just a lot of things that lead us to question. And I, I think my, my uh, perspective on confirmation of the irregularities or fraud was, was heightened as a result of that symposium. Thanks for that, Brad. I appreciate you again, uh, uh, even in your traveling here, getting on the broadcast. Uh, we'll go back to you. We'll we'll, uh, we'll circle back around to you, uh, uh, Paul. We were asking about the updates and about how they can, how when they do updates, they can actually remove data. Perhaps do we? And the question was, I guess, do we need to really? Is, are we in a are we in a red you know red level uh, scenario here where we have to stop, have to cut this off from the internet so we can they, so they perhaps don't erase data and start moving towards solutions for paper ballots. Any thoughts on that, Paul? Yeah, the updates were one of the big things that jumped out at me as a problem. And when we talk about a forensic audit, what I would suggest we probably need is something like a forensic audit that, you know, at the time the election ballot counting starts, you know, so you know what the condition of the machine, machine is when it's starting to, to count and tabulate the ballots. And then immediately after the election, you do another forensic audit there to make sure that there was nothing changed during that process. And if there has been anything changed, then that's not preserving the records of the election for 22 months as required by law. Uh, part of the problem is they said, we've got these laws, but we don't have any penalties for them. Uh, so maybe that's something that legislatures need to look into. What is the penalty for not preserving the election data information? Uh, one of the things, you know, it's a simple phrase. It's like drinking from a fire hose. And I think for a lot of us legislators there, when they started giving us all this information from so many experts 
and it was nonstop basically for three days. It was like having a fire hose stuck in your mouth and you're trying to drink from it. Uh, do we, we've, um, and I don't think our election officials, our county election officials, and maybe even the state election officials know everything that can go on there. These machines are made in China. And the question was asked, United States of America isn't smart enough to make our own voting machines. You know, I think one thing is you got to worry about is you can take over a country without firing a shot if you can rig their elections. That's right. And uh, one of the first rules of war is to know the enemy. So I'm concerned about the, the audits that we need to do and make sure we get the right information to ask the right questions. And um, us legislators went there to learn and to gather information and to gather contacts so we can use those contacts in the future to help us get the elections in our state right as well as the other states. And I think that's what all the legislators were looking for there. Stephen, do you think it's time to put the brakes on right now? As as Paul just stated, there's some things that you know this, this is an so it's, it's a dynamic process here that we're just learning because it's a complicated thing. It's like there's you know there's there's uh, IP addresses involved, packets, data packets, uh, uh, internet service, uh, you know, connection. Do you think we need to just put the brakes on right now, Stephen, and disconnect from the the internet, get these machines off the internet until we can figure out a better plan? Well, I think the, the problem they showed us is a lot of this stuff is embedded into the hard drives or the, you know, the, the mechanisms of this machine. Uh, you literally could do an inspection of the machine prior to an election, and you don't even know that stuff's buried into it. You know, that you mentioned earlier about um, preservation. You know, the big thing is, is a lot of people look at uh, that 22 months that they just have to have the ballots. But here's the problem is the ballots are the ballots, and they could preserve them, but what we're really concerned about is the history inside that machine. Um, you know, that was the argument with the election guy yesterday. Yeah, you can run a tabulation at the beginning. You can do an audit at the end. That's just auditing and giving you the numbers that you see on both ends. What we're concerned about is what's happening in between. And that's exactly right. We need to be, if we're going to continue with electronic devices, then we need hardening of uh, and protection but as the cyber experience people back there showed us uh, and with anything today i mean look at the the number one crime i think in in the world anymore is hacking uh people doing it full time these people are hacking into these systems with the basic cell phone in in less than five minutes so i it's huge but we have to think about that 22 month period that they're preserving. I think most people are just thinking it's just the ballot, but we're missing the boat if we don't preserve what happened inside those machines during the election. Yeah. Brad, we'll go back to you real quick uh, and then we'll move on to the next question. Your thoughts, Brad, real quick. Do you think the, we should shut down the, is it time to just take them off the internet until we can figure out a better plan? Any thoughts on that? I believe we need to go back strictly to paper ballots. There is no other way to provide total confirmation. And the other thing that I would suggest is that we have uh, check off uh, when information is given and when it's received. So that, for example, when a precinct reports information to the county, the county then confirms somehow that they did receive the numbers that that precinct provided and reports that number back to the uh, the precinct that reported them initially. So you have a sent confirmation and a received confirmation. And then when that county sends it off to the state, they say, here's how many votes in our county went for candidate A, here's how many went for candidate B. And the county uh, then receives confirmation from the state, here's what you sent us. And then when the state is reporting that, they get confirmation. So every time we send something, that number is confirmed. So we have a trail of acknowledgement that says all the way back to the precinct, here's the numbers that were reported. And those can be substantiated by paper ballots because the, if the information is captured in a machine, there is no way to prevent that information from being manipulated. And if there's no check on the information at every significant point of transfer, then we're not going to be able to absolutely without uh, question, confirm the number of ballots that were cast for a particular candidate. You know, we've had uh, we, we've we've heard stories of people going in to, to vote and they say, well, you've already voted. Um, we, we've heard uh, instances of, of, of 
people that there's not even an address and they're and they're voting dead people on the rolls. What was your what if you, when you went to the symposium and this is for people that are, are running the elections in the different counties to keep an eye out for what is the most common uh, error I guess or I guess we're calling an error for now and be kind what's the most common error that that you that you uh, that you came across at the symposium was it was it double uh, uh, you know voting for people twice was it dead people voting was it uh, um, you know uh, places that there was nobody at any residence uh, you know entire buildings people vote and no one lives there or is it a combination of all of them what what method did you did you uh, take away from that co- that conference that you see that they used mostly uh, to steal these votes and I'm going to say it. They stole. They still were stealing votes. I mean, I'm I'm not going to you know beat around the bush. Bob, your thoughts on that? Well, you missed our colleague, uh, our senator. But anyway, uh, um, oh, sorry about yeah, that, Teresa. Was- uh, we can we can stop, Teresa. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that, Bob. Hold that question, Teresa. Please. Yeah. I, I was asking. I was asking about the uh, the updates. Do we need to shut down the sure. uh, the machine? Sorry about that, Bob. Teresa, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. For the question, and uh, that was the reason for the phone call between myself and and Representative Cheetah and our Secretary of State's office this morning was to express our deep concerns um, and to gain her support on preventing any updates to the machines from this point forward until we get this straightened out. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Representative Cheetah was disconnected from the call, so he might not be aware, but she did agree. To that uh, she wants uh, safe uh, elections as well, and um, you know your Montana legislators. We did pass some really good legislation last session that she is now tasked with defending because uh, as soon as we passed voter ID, the Democrats brought a lawsuit against her. So so her focus is on defending what we've already put in place and keeping those laws in the books. And then it's the legislators task to evaluate what we've got going on right now with our uh, election integrity issues. So, um, so she did agree uh, to prevent the uh, county election clerks from doing any updates on the machines at this point forward. But unfortunately, we don't know what's been done since November 3rd to this date. Um, well, that's breaking news. I got to get a statement from uh, Secretary of State uh, Jacobson on that, because that would be breaking news if the Secretary of State of Montana has decided to stop the updates for the electronic voting machine because of the uh, the possibility of fraud. That is big news. We appreciate you breaking breaking that for us, Teresa. And uh, we're, that sounds like an article. I'm going to have to write on that one. Uh, okay, Bob, um, thanks again for that. Bob, if we can, six circle back around to the most common errors that you saw. Again, we've seen people showing up at the polls and they've already voted, uh, you know, de- dead voters, the whole, the whole, all the shenanigans. What, uh, what did you see? Did, did you bring out of the conference? What is the, is the area that we should concentrate most on here when we're looking for fraud? Did you see a, a pattern that developed uh, amongst the fraud, Bob, while you were there? The same question all around. Well, um, you're asking the wrong guy. I mean, what I uh, what what I got is they were using 2010 uh, data or census. I mean, uh, because so they could uh, uh, those people. A lot of those people probably had moved, or they probably uh, uh, you know passed away or whatever, and they were still using their names to fill out to, for ballots and stuff. But uh, that's um, uh, that's about basically what I got you. So. Fair enough. enough. Jerry. Okay. Thanks, Bob and Jim. Jim, what I'd like to do is take a little different tact here and and just encourage your listeners and you yourself, too, to go to rumble.com and access the Doug Billings show on about somewhere between the 12th and the 14th of August. He had as his guest a representative from the state of Arizona that was one of the presenters at our symposium. And in that hour program on on uh, the Doug Billing show, there he did a really excellent job of outlining what they've run into so far in the Arizona audit there, and and about some of the possible solutions as well. And one of the things that he definitely underscores is we have to go back to paper ballots. We have to have that initial count uh, from paper ballots. And he said if you want to still use electronics. You can possibly use them then to 
check and confirm what the paper ballot came out to be. But we definitely have to go back to paper. And one thing that I thought was really interesting, and that's in this hour program too, I've listened to it a couple of times actually since uh, coming home, that um, they're doing, and I think he said, I think he said over 20, 20 states have expressed an interest in or, and are going to do this as well as in their paper ballots, they're going to put um, ink colors just like we do in our currencies to try and help avoid the uh, fraud attempts. So um, between the, the colors and some um, IDs that are specific to each voter and each ballot, there's a lot of things we can do. And, and I think your readers or listeners would find that our interview especially helpful. Yeah, you can go right to uh, the right side with Doug Billings there on Rumble. Yeah, I've listened to a couple of those programs. It does a good job, that's for sure. Had a lot of great guests on there. Uh, I think Darren. I think Darren, you're up next here. Um, if you don't mind, did you see uh, what's your what's your takeaway from that? Uh, because we have voter harvesting that's happened. I've done back in Northwest Liberty News. I've done a couple of reports about the uh, the shenanigans that go on in the reservations. I've shown literal literal checks that were given to the uh, to the uh, 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 to the tribal members for votes um, so I mean it's the, it's not anything that's new uh, your thoughts that Derek on uh, Der- Darren I should say what is the most common thing that we should keep an eye out for uh, dead voters uh, duplicate votes um, you know what can we what can we give to the people that are trying to make a you know trying to uh, have fair and, and uh, honest elections Oh, Jim, to be honest, it's it's all the above. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's kind of a cop out of a cheap answer, but the, it, it, they use all of those techniques and it all feeds into a machine. And ultimately, that is that is where you have to go back to is getting rid of those machines. And a lot of those other systems will not work as well. Clearly, yes, you have to keep an eye out for people paying people for votes. You have to keep out on the, on the voter rolls in order to eliminate those phantom voters, dead voters, you know, you call them whatever you want. Uh, But that is in the end, if you want to really truly get to a free and fair election, that is legitimate, accurate for everybody. You've got to get rid of the machines and go to a paper ballot. Sometimes analog is better than anything. And by the way, I think I, uh, I broke the trend on the Doug Billing show by having good guests on there, but he is a, a great person as well. So <laughs> the, the people he brings on are, are, are pretty well with the exception of one that I know of. <laughs> no, you're, you're being a little hard on yourself there, brother. Uh, okay. Paul, uh, Paul, over to you. Uh, any, any areas specifically that we, we would need to target? I mean, obviously the overall get out of the electronic voting and get into paper. Uh, but did you see any specific area that you noticed in the conference that we should keep an eye on as far as, as uh, you know, and let's say we can't get the paper thing pulled off by the next election. You know, I mean, I don't know how easy it is just to stop everything and go to paper. Who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm not in the election committee, but Paul, anything we should uh, move forward. Uh, dead voters. I mean, that seems to be a big one. Anything else that, uh, that that piques your interest? One of the biggest takeaways I had from this thing was what happened when the ballot counting was shut down in a number of different states. Uh, they showed a graph of time on the bottom and the number of votes on the vertical scale. And basically Trump was ahead of Biden all through the process. And then when the voting machines shut down um, because there was a leak in the water main, which actually turned out to be a leaky toilet, all of a sudden at that point, the Biden votes went up right even with the Trump. It wasn't a graph, it wasn't a curve or anything. It was just a vertical ascent. You could see on the trend, The two votes are going along like this. And then all of a sudden, Biden's votes went straight up to meet Trump. And then it must be the algorithms kicked in. And Biden just kept edging a little bit higher than Trump all the rest of that voting term. And that all happened when the voting, uh, the ballot counting was shut down. And that's what the problem was, is we saw a film of ballot counting was shut down. And the ballot counters will come back and resume work at 10 o'clock the next morning. And then the cameras within the voting room show people running the same ballots through machines over and over and over again, and people pulling out ballots from under tables in boxes and running them through machines when the ballot counting was supposed to be shut down for one reason or another. And that probably stemmed from the fact they said that they expected Biden to win Florida. And when, um, Biden didn't win Florida because they've underestimated 
the people that were refugees from Cuba that came here and were so fed up with socialism, they voted Republican. And when the Democrats lost Florida, they kind of panicked a little bit and they had to come up with an ulterior plan to swing some of the other states. So all of a sudden, about 10 o'clock at night, ballot counting shut down, not just in one state, but in several states. And that's when everything happened. That's when Biden caught directly up with Trump in an instant. And that's when all this other shenanigans happened. So for one reason or another, when they say we're going to shut down the ballot counting and start again tomorrow, that's not what's happening. And, that, and what they're doing is they're getting rid of the people that are the election judges and the witnesses there so they can do their other stuff. Well, I tell you, I'm going to, I'm going to modify that question a little bit for you, Stephen and, and Teresa and Brad. And then what we'll do is we'll have you guys go around uh, the, the, uh, the, the circle one more time for, and we'll close out the interview. Uh, but I'm going to switch it up a little bit for you, Stephen. We, I think we, as Paul said, I mean, when I saw the video of them taking the thing, the, the, the suitcases from under the table and, and everybody left and then just running them through and running them through. I mean, this is, you know, a second grader could have figured out that there's something going on here. My question to you, Stephen, and, and then Teresa, and then over to you, Brad, is there going to be any, we talked earlier about any, any, you know, justice, where's the justice phase? And maybe some of them have been, but are these people that, that committed open fraud? I mean, it, it's a serious offense to try to, try to, you know, rig an election. I mean, I think it's a felony, <laughs> maybe five years in jail. Is there going to be a, uh, is there going to be a, a justice phase of this, Stephen? Did you get that impression from the conference that, 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 you know, I don't even know what the authorities these days who would do anything. The FBI can't really trust them so much, but that's another story altogether. Stephen, is there going to be a, is there going to be a justice phase of this, Stephen and, and uh, Teresa and uh, Brad? Well, I truly believe it depends on our constituents. People need to be paying attention. If they value their liberty, we're at a crossroads. People need to step up. They need to be writing their congressmen, their legislators. They need to be voicing their opinions. They need to be talking to their neighbors. They need to be sharing the things that, I mean, this is visual. We this, These aren't made up. That's one of the things that they're blocking in Arizona, as I understand it, is all of this communication in these systems goes through a router. Well, that router documents who, what IP came in at what time and what was transpired. And of course, they're blocking getting those. Uh, that's the whole thing, right? We're dealing with after, after what happened, it's been the block. I mean, it's almost impossible for them to cover it up because it's, it's obvious to a child if you gave them basic information, it can see, well, there's something wrong with that graph. Um, there's something wrong with what's happened here. But the thing of it is, is people need to be fed up. They need to stand up. They need to voice their opinions because we can do what we can try to do within our legal system. But I think for us to get anywhere at this point, it is really going to take a groundswell from the people and it should be of all parties because if one can do this, any can do this. And, and what, Right. more valuable thing do we have left than our vote That's i mean right. there is no other country that you can go to if we go down i mean it's gone and if we don't protect the right of your vote that it means something and it counts for something i mean we really have nothing left and and i don't know that we can get any um maybe through some of the courts, but it does fall back upon us as legislators, but we're going to have to have the voice of the people's support, I feel, to to get anything accomplished. Well, that's true. If uh, if U.S., if America falls, then the world falls, I, I believe. Uh, Teresa, is, uh, do you see a justice phase coming up here? Because I know that's the frustrating thing for patriots, that, that they can see we don't need any more investigations. We don't need any more you know committees. We know that they've committed crimes. They're pretty obvious. But the frustrating thing is that no one seems to want to put these scoundrels behind bars. Do you think we're going to have that? Uh, is that going to happen, do you think, at some point, Teresa? Well... Um, I agree with uh, Representative Galloway that it's going to take the groundswell of the people, but I believe that is, it is incumbent on the state legislatures to step up to the plate and follow their constitutional directive and take responsibility for the constitutional directive that we specifically have been given. And quite frankly, um, we haven't proven, in my mind, we haven't proven proof positive yet that we have election fraud in Montana. There's a lot of evidence to be considered that supports the idea 
that there is election fraud, specifically in Missoula. Missoula, the Missoula citizens and legislators have been the front runners in Missoula, in Montana, excuse me. But we we have to uh, we have to prove it, and we have to convince our fellow legislators of the voter fraud or voter inconsistency issues. And um, in my mind, at this point, which is subject to change based on additional information being received, the path forward for the legislators is that uh, I would like to see a select committee appointed specifically to investigate, which is one of our legislative powers, uh, Missoula County and the election process there and evaluate all the evidence and then um, make a decision on that. And if we determine that there is fraud there, then we would open it up to additional counties Mm -hmm. and consider Mm -hmm. the fraud and the evidence uh, there. And then from that point, we would have the foundation we need to call a special session and pursue the forensic audit. And uh, it's, it's very apparent to me that our citizens want a forensic audit, that we have to convince our fellow legislators that it's necessary. There's a Rasmussen poll out currently that 71% of Republicans want a forensic audit and 55% of our citizens overall want a forensic audit. So, um, and I believe that's displayed on the Election Integrity Center for Excellence, if your voters wanted to go and look look that up. But, um, you know, there's a process by which we have to adjudicate this and uh, it's incumbent on the state legislators to do it. Okay, last question for you, Brad. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the same same question with you then, and if you folks will indulge me for another seven minutes, I'll have everybody go around for a one minute uh, uh, answer. Uh, uh, Brad, uh, if we just found out that these people have committed election fraud, uh, how and when are we gonna are they gonna be brought to justice? I think that's sort of that's one of the big questions. Any thoughts? That's been a question a lot of people have asked us, Jim. Uh, is it possible for them to be brought to justice? And I believe the answer is yes. We just you know, the the process for putting together a case against somebody normally takes much more time and inordinately higher amount of time than the commission of the crime. So we're trying to figure out. And I'm not saying the crimes occurred. I'm just using that as a, a as a figure of speech. But whenever there's a, a problem, it takes a lot longer to build a case to identify if the problem you know was was uh, by omission or commission. And we're simply trying to do that right now. I want to hop back to a question you asked earlier about what you know. What do we need to do with with the elections to strengthen them? I think those people who are on the voter rolls who should not be on there need to be removed because that's where a lot of phantom votes are being brought in. We need to get rid of people who have not voted in the past two federal election cycles. Uh, as far as um, you know, the answer to the question, you know, can can they be brought to justice? Absolutely. I think that people who do wrong can be. And we had a, a gentleman by the name of Joel Oldman at the the. Uh, Symposium who talked about a VP at Dominion who, uh, and Oldman was on the call because he had somebody from Antifa uh, uh, patch him into it. And he said, um, you know, he, he was asked to give up the name of the person from Antifa. And he said, if I do that, that person's dead. But he, to- he told him that uh, this VP, and I can't remember Eric's last name, um, but uh, they said, well, what happens if Trump wins the election? And he said, there's no way he's going to win. We already have that taken care of. So I have a guy on, you know, a phone call to have the audio, audio recorded that some kind of process was in place to prevent Trump from winning. And this was, I believe, in August of 2020. So we're talking about at least three months prior to the election. So there are um, a lot of opportunities, I believe, to take the information that we're gathering now and bring the right kind of criminal charges against the people who have, who have engaged in fraudulent activity and again, as I said, Mesa County, Colorado, they indicated that there was some fraud that was done there. So bottom line is, will they be brought to justice if the, the people demand it? Because, we're, you know, the government's not going to come to save us. The legislature is not going to come to save us. We, the people, need to save ourselves. And I believe that's going to be the true testament of whether this is a, uh, this matter is resolved or not. Well put. I believe it. I've said that a long time. We can't 
No one's going to fly in with a cape and a pair of tights and make everything better. We all have to take that upon ourselves. Okay, we're going to go around, if we can, uh, just around the circle one more time, give you guys one more minute to close out. Uh, any any last-minute thoughts that you have? Uh, any websites? That would be a good time to give out any websites or any contact information if you want the folks that are interested uh, to hear more about you know what happened at the symposium, if they want to speak to you personally uh now's a good time to give that information out we'll start with you bob and we'll just move around the we'll just uh, move around sort of around the circle there and we'll end out the interview go ahead bob over to you okay well uh thank you for one thing jim for allowing us to come but uh um my i think if we do not get like was said if we do not get rid of uh, the voting machines and go to paper ballots then uh, the country that we grew up in will not be uh uh, we were, we we're going to lose it, period. And, uh, and, uh, anyway, I, um, I, I know I, I lost the train of thought here, but, uh, um, also what we need to do is get rid of the, uh, we just need to get rid of the machines period and go and go to paper ballots. I want to, uh, uh, Steve mentioned something, uh, representative Steve, he, uh, Here's something Ronald Reagan said. It says the, the lights go out here, meaning the U.S., they go out everywhere. And so we have to, we have to do something and, uh, and get, our, 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 get our, not only our country, but our state back in line. So. Thank you, Bob. Very good. Jerry? Yeah, thanks, Bob and Jim. One thing I would like to just uh, underscore that is so important about fair and free elections is one thing we heard a lot about at the symposium and we haven't talked about much here yet today is the threat to our free speech. And the people that we heard from that have been canceled on virtually every kind of forum that you can imagine, whether it's our president, whether it's you, Jim, whether Mike Lindell, many of the speakers, they've been canceled. They've been shut up. We didn't have most of our networks weren't there to cover this symposium because they don't want the word out. And a couple of them were uh, Newsmax and, uh, and uh, what is it, OAN. Um, they were served lawsuits on the first day of the symposium because they were there to cover it. So mm -hmm. this elections, it can't be uh, overstated how important it is if we're going to preserve our freedom or free speech. Everyone talks about Second Amendment. And we've seen what's happened since this administration's taken office. They have slammed the accelerator down on uh, on all of this cancel culture. So that, that's probably what I'd like to close with. Thank you very much, Jim, for you getting the word out. That's been my pleasure. Paul, we'll just stay in the same order that we are on the screen now. Paul, over to you. Hey, I, I want to get back to election judges. Um, I'm an election judge, and I'm, as the chair of our Sanders County Republican Party, I encourage a lot of people to become election judges. In the last year, we had about 20 new conservatives step up and take election judge training. Uh, I'm an election judge because I want to know what the rules are, what the checks and balances should be. So when I witness a ballot election, an election night, um, I know what to look for. So I encourage people to get involved. We have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people that participate. If you don't participate, this government isn't working for you. You're either at the table or you're on the menu. So get involved. <laughs> I like it. Teresa, any, any final words or any anything you'd like to say in closing, or any websites you want to give out or anything like that? You bet, Jim. Thanks for the opportunity. I would like to focus on some resources that the citizens have available to them for finding additional information. The first being frankspeech.com. Frankspeech.com. That's where they can go and see uh, the videos <clears throat> from the symposium. Secondly, on the platform of Telegram, they can download the app Telegram, and on Telegram, there is a group called Montana First Audit Chat, and that is where the citizens of Montana are gathering to discuss and plan and organize uh, their path forward uh, to support their legislators. I also have a face page I'd like to put a Constitutional Republican Facebook page. If they want to find me, they can find me there. Um, I'm trying. I've had, like I said, two or 300 people contact me um, wanting to be involved. So I'm going to try to get them plugged in. Um, another uh, website, letsfixstuff.org, is uh, Senator Pat Colbert from Michigan. They can go there. 
They can go to audit50.org is a, is a group of what they're referring to as super moms. They want, they want every state audited. There's a couple documentaries called Deep Rig and Kill Chain that our citizens should watch as well. And finally, I have a big announcement to make, and I want a, everybody to listen carefully. Dr. Doug Frank will be here in the Bitterroot Valley on September 22nd to give his presentation. And we want as many citizens and legislators and election officials as possible to be here on September 22nd in the Bitterroot Valley at the First Interstate Building to, to see and hear and meet Dr. Doug Frank and uh, review his evidence. That's very exciting. Very, mark, very exciting. Mark the date, folks. Mark the date. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Two big, two big uh, pieces of information you've, you've dumped on us here today, Teresa. Great stuff. Uh, Stephen, over to you. Final words um, and uh, in closing and any, anywhere you want to send people to check out more information. And oh, by the way, Teresa, if you send me that information over in an email, I'll include that in an article in the article. I'll include all those links for you. Okay. Stephen, over to Thank you. you. You're welcome. One, one big word, deviations. These, there was unprecedented deviations in this election and the people need to demand it be investigated and resolved. We, we, if we do not protect our liberties, we are not going to have them and they start at the ballot box. If we lose those, we've lost everything. Do not look to the national press. If you look into these things and you look deeply, there's many websites that you can do a little study on where they've tied different parties, different stocks, different ownership, and it all ties the media and certain corporations. They control the spin and the information, and if you listen to those and that's all you listen to, you're going to be completely indoctrinated. You might as well not even be thinking for yourself because they do not want the word out. You have to study out who you're taking your information from and, and probably pray about it if you want to have confirmation that you're getting information from the correct source. So, so you can get a hold of me at Galloway, the numeral 4, mt at gmail.com. I'll try to respond. But my last statement would be get involved or you're going to get what you get. Well put. Colonel Darren Gobb, uh, Executive Director of Restore Liberty. Uh, any final thoughts? And uh, I'm sure you're going to want to send people over to the Restore Liberty website. Over to you, my friend. Yep. Hey, thanks, Jim. That, that, that website is restore-liberty.org. And I was there working with a lot of people I've been working with since uh, prior to November. So it was great to be part of that symposium. Uh, I'll basically reiterate what everybody else has said, 100% in agreement. I did. I do get random emails from places in our general inbox for the organization. I'll tell you that uh, we've, I've gotten notes from Brazil and Australia and other countries who are watching this very closely. And if they, they are saying it themselves. If we lose it here, there's nowhere else to go. Here's an example of something. So we're, we're directly in connection with some of the pilots that are flying people out of Afghanistan at, as they're in route, uh, as they land. And some of the aircraft that have landed in, in countries have had people have been actually crushed in the wheel wells of those airplanes trying to escape Afghanistan. So let's make sure that we are we remain the kind of country that people want to escape to. And if we don't fix election issues across the country, we could become just like them. Yeah, there were some videos of some of those guys falling off the uh, off the, the 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 wheels as it was going in the air. Too, it's tragic. I mean, beyond tragic. Uh, Brad Cheetah, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and uh, give you the last word on this. Uh, anything you'd like to say in closing? Uh, anything you'd like to say and or in any uh, website you want to give out before we go ahead and close out the show? Well, th thank you again, Jim, for having this uh, this group of folks there. And uh, Colonel Gob, you. Uh, uh, do yourself a disservice by saying that uh, you were one of the uh, the folks on that radio program that did not live up to the high regard of others because you certainly are a person who is a true patriot. A lot of people look up to you, but I want to thank Darren and uh, Mary Beveridge, Jane Rechtenwald, other uh, civilians, you know, non-legislators, and all the legislators who attended the symposium. Because one of the things that, that people need to know is, uh, you know, we may be looked at as being a little... Um, uh, eccentric, or we may be uh, looked at by people as being half a bubble off or whatever they want to say. But I can assure you the people who attended that symposium 
from the top to the bottom, the people that I met are all patriotic citizens who simply want to find the truth. They want to know what, what is going on. They want credibility in our elections because the, the right to vote is sacred in the U.S. because it determines everything, out, uh, everything else uh, that occurs. Because I believe it was Lenin who said, it's not who votes that counts. It's who counts the vote Indeed. that counts. Yeah. And we don't want to get to a situation where that absolutely happens. Um, the Secretary of State's office was inundated with lawsuits from the day that we had legislated, legislation that was passed and signed into law. So we need to send emails to encourage uh, Secretary Jacobson, because I could tell from her demeanor this morning that she's under a lot of pressure and that stress is hitting her. But she nonetheless needs to keep encouraging us to investigate what is going on. And I believe uh, whoever said before, I think it may have been Teresa, that we start in Missoula because we have uh, an awful lot of information there. And then we move forward because the information we've been gathering has been taking place since January 4th, but it didn't really become all that well-known until, you know, toward the end of the legislative session. And it's become more, uh, more well-known now. Um, and uh, I guess with that, I would just uh, ask Teresa to make sure that we have the, the time on the 22nd of September when that's going to begin. So she'll send that off to you, Jim, so you can pass that along because people are going to be coming from distances and I'm sure that they will want to hear what Dr. Dr. Doug Frank has to say because he came up with some information that is absolutely, in, in my mind, uh, uncannily irrefutable in terms of how algorithms were set. And, uh, you know, he, he showed how in every county in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and I think in every county in the, in the country, that they had the same number of, or percentage of, of votes in certain categories in every age group from 18 to 100. And that is statistically impossible to have happen. So Dr. Franks is a, is a renowned physicist, the first person who photographs the atom at age 28. So this is not some guy who says, hey, I think I can come up with a formula that, that people will believe. He is a man who I believe has an awful lot of credibility behind his name. And he, along with folks like Seth Kessel, Phil Walter, and all the folks at Mike Lindell's put together his entire team, uh, Professor David Clements, who did a, a tremendous wrap-up at the, at the session. I think people need to look at what he had to say about the commonalities between uh, this cybercrime and a, uh, a murder that he was discussing. Uh, and he just he laid it out very intelligently and articulately and, and very logically. So um, get involved, people, you, you, whether it's, it's school board uh, elections, whether it's precinct committee men and committee women, whether it's election judges, Get involved because, as we heard uh, Representative Fielder say and Representative Galloway say, that you're if you don't get involved, you're going to receive whatever government uh, comes your way. Because, as, as the old saying goes, we don't get the government we want; we get the government we deserve, and that's based upon how involved we are in the process. Well, I can't tell each and every one of you how uh, how thankful I am uh, for first of all for your service, and uh, thanks so much for for being here on the broadcast today. I think that was an excellent roundtable discussion. Uh, I think we uh, fleshed out a lot of a lot of information. And really, basically, the theme, folks, is, you know, get off your keister and get involved, uh, or they're going to take, or your country is going to be taken from you um, by foreign, by, by foreign, by foreign entities that are trying to, you know, take things over. And I don't know exactly who it is. And these actual countries that are involved, but Certainly not, certainly not patriotic Americans, that's for sure. Uh, each and every one of you, I want to thank you so much for your patriotism and for standing up for the folks of Montana. And I uh, really do appreciate you all taking time to come on here today and your busy schedules to be on this program with me. Thanks again so much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. And God, God bless you. God bless everyone God here. bless you guys, too. God bless you all. Okay, there, there we go, folks. Uh, I tell you, uh, what a delight to have all those great legislators on the show with us today here and doing that roundtable discussion. Uh, fantastic time. Um, a lot of great, a lot of great folks there. I tell you, that's the, some of the best, the best there. And, uh, we we're just delighted that they took some time to come on here on my radio show. Uh, keep an eye out for support us folks, uh, at Montana Gazette radio.com, Montana Gazette radio.com and Montana daily Gazette.com. Uh, if you want to find out all the updates on the, um, the radio show and, uh, we should be having the, the computers literally in transit should be here any, any time. I thought it might come during the show here today, but uh, we'll have the computer that's going to run the network here at this location today, and that means we're going to be kicking off uh, the AMNFM broadcast here shortly. So uh, please continue to follow us on MontanaGazetteRadio.com. That's MontanaGazetteRadio.com for all of these live broadcasts 
and all the updates on the radio show and much, much more. Uh, thanks again for looking in today. I want to thank each and every one of my guests for being here today. And uh, what a great show that was. And I, I, it's because of them, not because of me. And uh, I do appreciate, again, them coming on. And uh, we will look to, we'll talk to you next time. This is James White for Montana Gazette Radio saying bye now.